our speaker, Maud, how do you, Maud, is it Rao? Rao. Rao. So Maud Rao joined the San Diego Air and Space Museum as a docent in the spring 2022. Following his retirement, Maud spent most of his 36-year career developing new materials used to fabricate the most advanced semi semiconductor chips that go into PCs, tablets, and smartphones, which I have a chip I might need you to identify. Uh, but <laughs> so, Maude has a PhD and master's degree in material science and engineering from Pennsylvania State University and a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Maude and his wife Linda moved to California in 2014 and live in Carlsbad. So thank you, Maude, for agreeing to present to our group today. To give him a warm Dudley for uh, <laughs> allowing me to, to make this presentation. You know, I, since I've been here, I, I, I really, really enjoy uh, being a docent. Uh, I've, I've met wonderful people. I've really got to learn a lot about the history of aviation. You know, I'm a technologist, as you heard from, from, my, uh, in, from the introduction, but I really am fascinated by how, what people think how they attack the problems and what other things have been going on. So it, it occurred to me that there are a whole bunch of firsts in aviation, but we never really hear about what happened to the other guys, right? And so the talk today is going to be focused on, let's see if we can understand a little bit about the other people that were trying to do the same, same things. And I'm going to focus on three things. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the race of the Arabs, putting the first balloon up. And they, it, we all know that the Montgolfier brothers are, are credited with the first, first balloon, but there were others that were working on it at the same time. We'll, we'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about uh, the English Channel crossing by uh, Louis Blerio, but there were other people trying to do it at the same time. And, of course, we can't uh, cover this topic without talking about the, the, the mad dash across the Atlantic and all the people that were trying to, to uh, achieve the, the first transatlantic flight in 1926, 1927. So that'll be the focus of the talk today, so let's, let's begin. So when we look at uh, the first balloon flight, um, obviously the, the Montgolfiers are the ones that, that get credit for it, but there was another person, Jacques Charles, who was also looking at ballooning at the same time. And he was looking at the problem from a slightly, uh, slightly different approach, and, and we'll talk about that today. Interestingly, you know, the, the Montgolfier brothers were, were children of uh, Pierre and Anne de Montgolfier. Uh, Anne was very prolific. She had 16 children. Um, Joseph and Jacques were number 12 and 15, respectively. Uh, the father owned a paper-making uh, company in Annonay, France, which is a little bit south of, of Lyon. And uh, when the father died, the older brother, uh, their older brother, Raymond, took over the business. Uh, and then Raymond's uh, unfortunately died. And so the, the business fell to Jacques. And Jacques was the kind of guy that had a, had a very analytical mind and a mind for business. So he was the right choice to take over, take over the business. His brother Joseph, though, was a little bit different. Uh, I, I've heard uh, people describe him as a dreamer. He had several different vocations throughout his career. And one day he was looking at a fire. And he observed the smoke rising from the fire, and he also observed that the embers were rising. And he wondered, is the fire producing a different gas that is causing the, the smoke and the embers to, to, to rise? And he thought, you know what, if we were to capture this gas, maybe we can put it to use. So he built, out of a, a sticks, a, a frame, three feet by three feet by four feet high. He wrapped it in paper on five sides, leaving the bottom open, and in his home he lit some paper, put the, put the uh, contraption over the paper, and to his amazement, and to the amazement of his brother, and to the amazement of their housekeeper, they saw this thing float to the ceiling. And he said, wow, there is something here. Right? So he and his brother uh, then went to, to work on, can we use this concept to lift people into, space, into, into the air? So their first experiment was a balloon that was uh, 36 uh, cubic feet. And this was the one that was, was done indoors. Um, they really didn't share this with many people. Uh, and they did another experiment in, uh, in December of 1782, which is the first outdoor test uh, of a balloon about 325 uh, cubic feet in, in volume. 
Uh, they had four people holding this balloon down, and the lift was so strong that they could not hold onto it. They released it, and it sailed uh, for about 1.2 miles through the air. I mean, the peasants were absolutely terrified. What is this thing that they've never seen before? Um, and so the, the, the brothers started to get uh, famous locally. And they then did a, a, an outdoor test, which was the first public demonstration. So in, in many of these things, uh, you would pay to go in and see something happen, right? And, and so uh, people would, would, would pay a small amount of money to, to come into this field to, to observe this. In, in June of 1783, they did an unmanned test with a, with a very large balloon, 28,000 cubic feet. And people watched it sail three to 5,000 feet into the air and travel about one and a half miles. Now the, the brothers were getting really famous and they got asked by the king to make a demonstration. And this is the, the demonstration that we all know about in September of 1783 in Paris. Uh, they sent up a duck, a sheep, and a cockerel. Uh, king Louis XVI was in attendance. Marie Antoinette was in, was in attendance. Um, it was a much larger balloon, 37,000 cubic feet, and it traveled two miles across the city of Paris. Then they started to get daring and say, well, can we actually put a person on one of these things? And they actually did, in October of 1783, a tethered flight. And this was the only flight in which one of the Montgolfier brothers was in the basket. And he rose up to a, flight, a distance of 75 feet, but it was the first tethered flight was the first untethered man flight. I just turned it on. And the two pilots were Jean-Francois Pilatre de Roussier and Francois Laurent de La Ronde. Um, Jean-Francois was a chemistry and physics uh, teacher. Uh, Francois Laurent was in the military. and it was a large, huge balloon, 60,000 cubic feet. Right? And this is the achievement that, that we all uh, celebrate as the first uh, human flight, uh, untethered human flight in history. But there was another person at the same time working on the same problem. And his name was Jacques Charles. Charles was a mathematician, an inventor, and a scientist. And he was intrigued by a recently discovered new element called hydrogen. Hydrogen was discovered or uh, identified as, a, as an element on the periodic table in 1776 by Henry Cavendish in, in England. They knew about hydrogen prior to that, but it was Cavendish who identified it as a, an element that should belong as a, a, on the periodic table. And the interesting thing about hydrogen, of course, which we all know today, is that it does have lifting power. Right, so they would fill a glass vial with hydrogen, weigh the glass vial, and then they'd release the hydrogen and weigh the glass vial, and lo and behold, it weighed less. Which, in, which means that there is a force that can be generated by capturing hydrogen. Well, Charles was interested in the use of hydrogen, and he was actually following the work of another man named Tiberius Cavallo. And Cavallo was a physicist. He was born in Naples. Uh, he moved to London in 1779. And in 1781, he was elected to the, as a fellow of the, of the Royal Society. He had done a lot of uh, research on hydrogen. And his interest was to see if he could uh, generate enough lift with hydrogen. Here is a, is a diagram of his contraption. So in this bottle, he would generate hydrogen using a chemical reaction, which we'll describe in a few minutes. The hydrogen would leave this bottle, go into this one, go basically a, a bubbler to uh, remove any of the residual chemistry from it, and uh, it would go into an animal bladder. Of course, all of his animal bladder experiments failed because he didn't have enough displaced volume to generate enough lift to, to raise the bladder into, into the air, but he was able to demonstrate that you could float uh, soap, film, soap bubbles if you filled them with hydrogen. And so it was Cavallo's uh, experimentation 
that uh, Jacques Charles was using uh, as the genesis for using uh, for building a hydrogen balloon. And this was around the same time, and you'll see in a few minutes, around the same time as the Montgolfier brothers, within days. Um, so let's talk a little bit about hydrogen. the advantages of hydrogen, as we all know. It's got a much higher lifting capacity than air, so you can use a smaller volume to lift the same amount of weight. Um, you don't need a heat source to remain airborne. But the disadvantage of hydrogen is it is the smallest element on the periodic table, which means that it's very difficult to contain in a volume that's also light. And this was the problem that Jacques Charles and a couple of his uh, colleagues had solved, and we'll get to that in a moment. And the other problem with hydrogen is it's not readily available, right? We're talking about 1780, right? This is before industrialized chemistry. Today, I can go down to the welding shop and, and buy a cylinder of hydrogen. <laughs> they needed to come up with a way of making large volumes of hydrogen. So the two problems are hydrogen containment and hydrogen generation. Jacques Charles and two brothers, Anne Jean and Nicolas Louis Robert, known in France as Le Frère Robert, <laughs> developed a method to coat silk with a solution of rubber and turpentine. The advantage here. The advantage is that you could make the silk impermeable but it was also a very thin film, so it didn't add a lot of weight to the silver. So what uh, Charles and the, the brothers did is they made a large balloon volume and would coat that with this mixture of turpentine and rubber. The turpentine would evaporate, there'd be a very thin film on the silk, which would be impermeable to hydrogen. The other problem is generating hydrogen itself. In those days, in order to generate hydrogen, you'd have to take iron, put a mixture of water and acid on the iron, which would form a chemical reaction liberating hydrogen. The issue is that it requires a lot of iron and it requires a lot of acid and a lot of water. So how do you fill a balloon uh, with hydrogen? Well, a couple of years after the Montgolfier brothers, uh, Cavallo wrote a very famous book called The History and Practice of Aerostation. And in this book, Cavallo describes how you uh, fill a hot air balloon and how you fill a hydrogen balloon. If you look at the, this is a, a, a drawing uh, from his book. On the left hand side is the uh, method for filling a hot air balloon, and the right hand side is the method for filling a hydrogen balloon. In both cases, the balloon is designed with a loop at the top. And if you uh, pass a rope between, uh, through that loop, over that hole, you build a fire, you inflate the balloon, you then release the hole downs, you release the, wire, the, the rope on top, and the balloon goes into, into the air. For hydrogen, remember, you need to make it as you're going to use it. So the, the modern, no, modern, the, after, after, after Jacques Charles did it, uh, the, the, the method was to take barrels of iron, and then you would pour this acid water mixture into the barrels of iron. It would generate hydrogen. The hydrogen was piped to a central tank, which had water in it. It would bubble through that tank. The purpose of the tank was to reduce the temperature because the evolution of hydrogen is an exothermic process. It generates a lot of heat. And also to remove any of the, uh, the acid vapor that could be in, in, in the hydrogen. And it was then piped through a leather, uh, leather tube to the balloon itself. The balloon is hung by this wire that sits on, goes through the, uh, the loop, and eventually you fill that balloon with hydrogen, and when you're ready to release it, you release the gondola and the, and the balloon uh, escapes. Now, Jack Charles and the, and the uh, Robert brothers built a balloon in August of uh, 1783. This is 88 days before the Montgolfier man flight. It was a 1,200 cubic foot balloon. In order to fill it, they needed 500 pounds of iron, 500 pounds of acid, and 2,000 pounds of water. It took them three days, three days to, to, to fill this balloon. It was an unmanned flight. When 
they released, released it and traveled for 12 miles from Paris. It stayed aloft for 45 minutes, and it was extremely frightening to the, to the, to the peasants. When it finally landed, uh, the, the farmers attacked it with pitchforks. <laughs> it tells you that uh, tech, people were not yet ready for the technology. <coughs> but in December of 1783, just 10 days after the Montgolfier brothers, Jacques Charles and uh, Nicolas Robert were the first to uh, be lifted into the sky with a hydrogen balloon. So you can see that they were neck and neck in trying to be the first. Uh, their balloon was substantially smaller than the, the Montgolfier's balloon, about one-fourth the size. It traveled 11 miles, stayed aloft for two hours, and reached a, an altitude of, of 1,800 feet. In, in this case, because of the, the, the Montgolfier brothers that already demonstrated uh, ballooning, a very large crowd was formed. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was at the launch of the, the hydrogen balloon, as well as uh, Joseph Montgolfier as well. So, just within a matter of days, if it, they were 10 days sooner, we would be celebrating Jacques Charles, it, uh, and, and uh, the Montgolfiers might have been forgotten. After the ballooning adventures, uh, Joseph uh, continued his inventions. Uh, he invented a, a water pump that was used in their papermaking factory. He died in, in 1810. Uh, Jacques died in 1799 uh, in, in, a, in an accident. Um, his son-in-law took over the company. In fact, the papermaking company uh, still exists. It's under a different name. It's under the name of the, the uh, son-in-law's family's name, not Montgolfier. Um, and to, to honor the Montgolfier brothers, the French word for hot air balloon is Jean-Charles had seminal work in hydrogen that led to the development of dirigibles and airships, in fact, the year after, or year and a half after his flight, uh, he filled a dirigible with hydrogen and demonstrated that hydrogen could be used in, in, a, in a dirigible. We, we know the history of, of hydrogen through uh, Zeppelins and, and uh, their military uses. Um, he's also credited with developing a relationship between the volume of a gas and the temperature. And uh, it's called the Charles Law. This is, this is the law basically, if you have a volume of gas in an enclosed space, at one temperature, you change the temperature, you can calculate now what the volume of the gas is going to be. At the, uh, at the new temperature, that can be used in uh, designing balloons uh, and, and other things in, in chemistry. The two original guys who flew with the Montgolfiers, uh, Jean-Francois, um, actually set a record with Joseph Proust. Um, and he traveled 52 kilometers in 45 minutes in a hot air balloon in 1784. Uh, about uh, seven months after the, the original flight, uh, set a speed, altitude, and distance record. Uh, unfortunately, he died in June of 1785 while attempting to cross the English Channel in a hydrogen balloon. And I think it's believed that he's the first uh, aviation fatality in history. Is that Proust the author? Uh, no, that's Marcel Proust. Um, Francois Laurent proposed uh, crossing the English Channel in 1784, but he never did it. Um, he was dismissed from the military after the French Revolution, revolution uh, on allegations of cowardice and died in 1809. So you can see that late 1700s, there was a lot of stuff happening in aviation. Most of the time we hear about the Montgolfiers, but we do need to give credit to John Charles and Le Frere Robert. Montgolfier did not use hydrogen. No, he did not. He used hot air. Hot air. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So they were using two different technologies, but are at the same time. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about the crossing of the English Channel. Right. We know the guy at the left. I wish I had the uh, the mustache wax concession for Louis Blériot. I think <laughs> yeah, it would, would have been a very uh, very wealthy person now. Uh, but the person on the right is the person that, that that's really of interest to me. His name is uh, Hubert uh, Lantham. Arthur Charles Hubert Lantham. So Lantham uh, was born in 1883. He was born to a wealthy family. His mother's family were bankers in England. His father was a merchant. And like uh, many young men who were born of wealthy families, he had to find a career. Right? And if you were a wealthy uh, person in, in Europe or England uh, looking to find a career, you, had, uh, you, you picked two of the following three. 
You wanted a career that involved power, involved fame, or involved adventure, right? And you picked two of those. If you wanted power and fame, maybe you went into law, maybe you went into government. If you wanted power and adventure, maybe you went into the military. But Hubert chose fame and adventure. And his life is chronicled, as you chronicle his life, and what I'll do in the next few minutes, and show you how adventurous he actually was. So he took the first night crossing across the English Channel with his cousin, Jacques Fowler, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, um, in a hydrogen balloon in February 1905. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it was the first crossing. He flew a, a night crossing. He also uh, raced in a, a boat race in Monaco in April 1905. He was the helmsman of this race. Uh, this is an actual photo of the boat that he was driving uh, from the Monaco Regatta in 1905. The boat, the boat was actually uh, designed and built by a company called the Antoinette Company, and we'll come back to the Antoinette Company in a moment. Uh, the, the Antoinette Company was based uh, on the concept of building engines, and the chief engineer, uh, Louis Lafayette, Basur was the one that actually built or designed the engines that the Antoinette company was, was building. They decided, hey, let's put these engines in something that'll go fast and show people how good our engines are. And uh, Latham, L L Latham was, the, uh, was the pilot in this particular one. Continuous story of adventure between 1906 and 1908. He led an expedition to Ethiopia to collect samples for the History Museum of Paris. Uh, and then when he returned back to France in September, in September of 1908, he witnessed right, the global rights flight uh, in Le Mans, where he was actually demonstrating the right flyer to the French government. And I think that's what may have spurred uh, Latham to, to take up uh, aviation. Now I mentioned uh, Louis Lababassour. Uh, he and another person, Jules Gaston B, formed another company called La Société Antoinette, this company was focused on building engines for airplanes. It turns out that Jules was a distant cousin of Latham, uh, and uh, the company designed and built its first airplane in 1907. And uh, this is a picture of it. It's called, what else, the Antoinette. It's the Antoinette company, the Antoinette engine, and the Antoinette airplane. Uh, Antoinette was uh, Jules Gaston Bede's daughter's name, and so everything was in memorial to his daughter. Latham joined the Antoinette Company in 1908 and uh, was very adept at flying this particular plane. It's hard to see, uh, but there's a, there's a wheel on the right-hand side of this plane, right about there. And in fact, this plane had two wheels, one on either side of the pilot. And that's how the pilot would control it. You'd have to turn one wheel in one direction and the other wheel in the other direction, controlling the wings and controlling the, the, uh, the rudder. And it was very tricky to fly, but somehow Latham had a knack for it. So within months he learned to fly it, he became a chief pilot, a chief instructor. Um, he set some European records, the longest uh, flight time, 67 minutes in the Antoinette in May of 1909. And around the same time, of course, our buddy, oh, I forgot to mention one thing about uh, Society Antoinette. Louis uh, Blario was the vice president of that company. <laughs> At the same time, uh, Louis, uh, who's, the, who's the, the other protagonist in this adventure, right? He uh, grew up, uh, went to Ecole Centrale in Paris. It's a very famous uh, engineering school. He was, I would say, uh, an average student. I think he was 113th out of 230 students. But he was very creative. Uh, he got a job at an electrical engineering firm in Paris. And while he was there, he conceived a means of uh, headlights for automobiles and trucks. So he formed a company in 1897 called the Lario Company. And it focused on uh, building headlamps for cars and trucks. And he won the supply contract for Renault and a company called Panhard, which is no longer here, I believe. But here is a canard, uh, 12 horsepower, around 1902, and there you have Lario's headlamps uh, on, on the car. And you know, he generated, he made a lot of money uh, selling these headlights. Uh, and with that, 
uh, he fed his interest in aviation. He actually became interested He actually became interested in aviation after seeing uh, an experimental monoplane in the uh, 1900 Paris Exposition. Uh, at, at around the late 1800s, there was a person named Clement Adair who had uh, designed a steam-powered plane. He was actually contracted by the French military to demonstrate it. Uh, it never flew. Uh, the military canceled its contract, but they put that plane in the exhibition in Paris. And that kind of spurred uh, Blériot to uh, look into uh, look into making a contribution to flight. So in 1906, he formed a business uh, to, to build planes under the uh, company named Recherche Aeronautique Louis Blériot. Um, and in November 1907, he demonstrated the first successful flight on a monoplane in his Blériot 7. And here's Louis sitting in his Blériot 7. Uh, boy, that's a pretty rickety looking aircraft. Uh, he's got propellers that look like, to me, something you'd use to go kayaking with. <laughs> but he was able to get off the ground, and he, he was the first to demonstrate uh, a flight of a, of a monoplane. Skip ahead to 1909, which is a very eventful year for, uh, for Blériot. Um, in June of 1909, he was the first to fly two passengers in his Blériot 12. And the two passengers were Albel Albert Alberto Santo Dumas, and André Fournier. Uh, he traveled a distance of 250 meters. And here, here's what the Blario 12 looks like. And here's the photo. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is before the flight or after the flight of uh, Santo Dumont and Fournier. And there's Louis Blario in the background. So he's already getting a reputation after his first uh, mono, mono, uh, monoplane flight and now uh, flying two passengers. He's always getting, already getting a, a, a reputation um, as, a, as an aviator. So, um, in July of 1903, about two weeks before, two and a half weeks before his English Channel crossing, uh, he competed in, the, in a race at uh, Douai, and he stayed aloft for 47 minutes and 17 seconds. Now, when you consider the distance across the English Channel, it's about 35 to 40 minutes. That, that's a pretty, pretty good time, if, if, the play, if the engine works and everything. Uh, unfortunately, what happened is, during this flight, insulation around the engine fell off, and Blériot was badly burned on his foot. The first person to make that channel crossing was Latham in July of 1909. And this picture, I don't know how well you can see it, this is a, a, an original picture from the period. Uh, there's Latham leaving uh, Calais Peninsula. Um, and uh, he was in the number four version of the Antoinette plane. And unfortunately for Latham, his engine died mid-channel. And so we had to, to uh, dump the plane. <laughs> and I think he's the first person to make a water landing uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in, a, in an airplane. Um, fortunately, though, the plane did float. And he sat on the plane while a, uh, a French uh, torpedo boat, the Harpoon, uh, actually went and picked him up. And this is an original photo from that period. This is six days before Blériot. July 21st, Latham receives a replacement plane. This is now the Antoinette 7. And July 22nd, Blériot arrives at Calais with his Blériot 11. The weather was bad. But there was a break in the weather on July 25th. And Blériot gets up early. He decides that he's going to try the crossing despite his badly burned foot. The picture on the left is a picture from that period. I don't know about you, but to me that tells me that he's a little bit nervous yeah. about making that flight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the picture on the right is a, an actual picture of Blario at, as he was leaving Calais that day. He was uh, escorted part of the way by a, another French uh, mil, uh, Navy uh, boat called the Escopette. Uh, here are some pictures from the Escopette. There's Blario above the, the English Channel. Uh, portrait or a side angle view and a front angle view. So I think we know a little bit about the, uh, the Blériot flight, but let me review it. This is a, a poster made to describe Blériot's flight. It's in French. I have a friend who speaks French, so, so she translated it for me. So on uh, July 25th at 3 o'clock in the morning, Blériot leaves his, um, his hotel and goes to the site of the farm 
which is holding his, uh, his plane. Uh, he decides to make a practice run, a test flight at 4.10 a.m., and he flies over a town called Sanget. Well, guess who's at, at Sanget? It's Hubert Latham. And he wakes up hearing this motor noise at 4.10 a.m., and a newspaperman tells him that Blair was going to try to make the English Channel run. So he <coughs> makes a mad dash to Sanget, gets there just in time to see Blario take off. <laughs> so he's, he's a little bit late. Uh, Blario takes off. Um, he's followed by this, the destroyer Escopet, uh, but he's got a strong tailwind, and he gets ahead, of the, gets ahead of the boat and flies into a fog bank. So he's lost for 10 minutes in this fog bank. He, fortunately for him, he's able to keep it above water, but there is a, a, a net wind moving toward Deal in England. So it, it kind of sends him off course. He, um, he, does, he, he goes towards Deal, he doesn't recognize it, he's looking for his landing site, um, but he decides to follow some ships because he figured those ships are probably going to Dover, and he knew that the, he knew that the, the landing site was near Dover, and so he follows those ships, uh, he gets to Dover, and he sees an empty field where there's a person uh, waving uh, a flag indicating that this is the location that, that he should, should be landing. And he makes a hard landing. Uh, he basically crumples the, the landing gear. Uh, here's Louis uh, after, after his flight, and he did it. He was the first person to cross the English Channel. But if Latham had been awake and not asleep, he might have seen the break in the weather and may have done it first. What I found very interesting about this is the Wright brothers' reaction to, to, the, uh, to Blerio's victory, right? So first of all, the, there was a prize of a thousand pounds by the Daily Mail for the first person to, to cross the English Channel. And these are some quotes uh, in the New York Times on January 26, 1909. So it says, Blerio's successful flight was splendid, said Wilbur Wright. This evening, no, this one, this evening. I know him well, and he's just the kind of man to accomplish such an undertaking. He is apparently without fear, and what he sets out to do, he generally does. And this is the part that gets me. This recklessness makes him anything but a good avi aviator, however, for he lacks entirely the element of caution. His speed was excellent, and his machine made faster time than I thought it was capable. So it was kind of, nice job, Lario, but you were pretty lucky. And uh, Orville was a little bit even more critical. He said, I'm glad Lario won the prize offered for the first airplanist to cross the channel, said Orville right heartily. But I can't for the life of me understand how he ever managed to do it with the flyer that he has. His motors struck us as both being well nigh impossible while he seemed to lack control over his machine. The great number of accidents in which he was figured with his flyer discovered, disclosed his lack of control while his engine never could be depended upon. So it was a backhanded comment by the Wright brothers who I think were a little bit miffed that somebody did it before they did. But you know, Latham was not going to be deterred. On July 27th, two days later, he was gonna make a second attempt at the, the channel crossing in his new plane, the Antoinette 7, but he again had difficulty and he plunged into the, the, the channel uh, before he reached over. Uh, the story is that on this flight, he was just sitting uh, on his plane. He lit a cigarette, waiting for the for the for the uh, ship to, to pick him up. But you know, he did continue his efforts in aviation. And uh, after the Channel crossing in 1910, he set records for speed and records for altitude. In November, he makes the first flight over an, Ameri over an, over an American city. And this was in Baltimore, sponsored by the Baltimore Sun. He also uh, flew over Los Angeles and San Francisco in late 1910 and 1911. Sadly though, his uh, fame and adventure caught up to him. In June 1912, he was mauled to death by a wild buffalo during a hunting trip to the Congo. He was only 29 years old. So A bad day. A, a, a very bad day. But you know, we have to give credit to Latham. He, he was uh, a man who lived on the edge. A man who lived on the edge. I thought he wouldn't let anything go. Uh, that's right. George said he didn't think any, anything. Yes. It's the most dangerous animal. He was the first guy to shoot a bird from an airplane. He was the first guy to shoot a bird from an airplane. He was invited to a hunting expedition in Los. I think it was Los Angeles, right, Chuck? And uh, he said, "Well, I'm going to get in the plane and shoot, shoot from the plane. Uh, shoot, shoot the birds from the plane rather than on the ground." 
After the, after the Channel Crossing, uh, Blario received 900 orders between 1909 and 1914 for his Blario 11. Um, in 1914, he becomes the president of uh, Society for l'Aviation et ses dérivés, SPAD, right? that made uh, planes during World War I. He was present when Charles Lindbergh landed at Le Bourget Airport in 1927. And this statistic I found really fascinating. In 1930, he established the Blériot Trophy, which was to be given to the first crew to, assist, to uh, achieve a sustained flight, flight speed sorry, of 2,000 kilometers per hour for more than 30 minutes. In 1930, he was anticipating that we could travel at 2,000 kilometers per hour. Think of this. In 1930, probably the average speed of the airplane was about 230 to 250 kilometers per hour, right? And he's already thinking that, hey, it may be possible to, to do something faster. The winner of the Blériot Prize was actually a crew from Edwards Air Force Base in 1961, so 31 years after the establishment of the Blerio uh, Trophy in a Convair B-58. And uh, Blerio had died in 1934 of a heart attack. His wife actually presented the, uh, the Blerio Trophy to the crew. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the plane that, that, that won the, the Blerio Trophy. So let's see, I've got uh, a little bit of time left. Um, let's talk about the mad dash across the Atlantic, right? This is one that I think we all have bits and pieces of, but I found real fascinating when I, when I was doing the research on this. Um, as we all know, the, the, uh, the, the impetus right, for crossing the Atlantic was the uh, Orte Prize. A little bit about Raymond Orte. He was born in France, in the uh, Pyrenees region of France. At the age of 12, he went across uh, to America to live with his uncle. He went alone across to America age of 12 to live with his uncle. Um, he got jobs as a busboy, he got jobs as a waiter, he got jobs as a maitre d'. Eventually uh, made enough money to buy a, a hotel uh, called the Lafayette Hotel. The Lafayette Hotel was a hangout for French aviators um, and so he became pretty wealthy. He was able to buy a second hotel and in 1919 he established uh, the Ortique Prize. The prize at that time was only for Allied flyers. There was, those were the only people that were eligible. Six years into it, nobody had actually even tried. Um, and so he renewed it in 1925 and made it open to uh, any, any, any flyer. The first person to try it after the uh, renewal of the Ortega Prize was uh, René Fonck. Fonck was a World War I ace, as we all know. I think he had 73 or 74 victories. Uh, he was a small man with a large ego. Um, he had convinced Igor Sikorsky to, to build a plane specially for uh, the flight across the Atlantic. It was a, a, a triplane. It was a modification of a plane that Sikorsky already had in the design uh, that he was building for passenger uh, travel. Uh, and uh, so uh, Fonck convinced him to make a donation for this prize. Uh, uh, Sikorsky put in, I think, $120,000 to build this plane in, in 1926, a big, big amount of money. Um, the interesting thing was it was very well appointed for a plane that was going to go across the Atlantic, right? It had tables and chairs. The idea was that we we're going to have four people in this plane. Um, it required 2,500 gallons of fuel, 15,000 pounds, about 15,000 pounds of fuel. Uh, Rene Fonk was going to, uh, to be the pilot. Lawrence Curtin was the navigator. Uh, Jacob Islam Islamoff was the engineer, and Charles Clavier was the, the radiator. Here's a, here's a picture of the, the plane in the morning of the, the flight. They're preparing it. What I'd like to point out is these little wing, these little uh, wheels right here behind the main landing gear. There's a set on either side underneath the wings, and there's a set in the rear. These will be crucial when uh, Funk makes the attempt to cross the Atlantic. Uh, these wheels were designed to be jettisoned after the plane got airborne. And so in the morning of the flight, uh, the crew got on board. Uh, people were lining both sides of the runway. Uh, the, this was in, in, in New York. The, uh, the plane started down the runway. Unfortunately, 
it was at least 4,000 pounds over its design weight. So it took a long time first to get up to speed, and while it was getting up to speed, the left auxiliary wheel fell off and flew behind. That caused the plane to lurch to the left. Funk was able to recover it, continued down the runway. A little bit further down the runway, the right wheel fell off. There's a big embankment at the end of the runway that he needs to clear. Shortly after the, the second pair of wheels, the rear wheels fell off. They, they kicked up and damaged the elevator and, and rudder on the, on the left-hand side. So here's Funk trying to get this plane off the ground, not to hit the embankment. He does manage to get it airborne, just barely clears the embankment, and then the plane dips on the other side of the embankment and bursts into flame. Um, Funk and uh, Lawrence Curtin survived. So this is, this is a, a picture from the embankment showing the plane on fire. This is what it looked like after the fire had been uh, put out. There's basically nothing left of the plane. Uh, the New York Times had a big uh, spread saying that two people had died. The mechanic and the radio men had died. They were in the back of the plane. Funk and the, the navigator survived. Uh, the story is that Funk and the navigator made a hole in the, uh, 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 in the ceiling of the cockpit and escaped through the ceiling of the cockpit and they were trying to avoid the spinning propellers, uh, which, they, which they eventually did. When the uh, investigation took place, the uh, investigators found that the plane was severely overweight. A lot of people blamed Funk. They he said that, you know, hey, he might be a good World War II pilot, but this is an experimental plane and you need a special set of skills to fly it. Uh, Sikorsky was a little bit more uh, circumspect. He said, and I'll quote him here, he said, he said, after the crash, he said, we will go ahead. Aviation must be prepared to meet these things as they occur. From the disaster itself may come great strides forward. No one who flies ever becomes disappointed by death and discouragement. So Sikorsky was pretty philosophical about it. So in, in, the, in the great group of flyers, Fonk is out. The next person to try is Admiral Richard, Richard Byrd. Byrd, uh, as you are probably aware, was very famous for his Arctic expeditions. In the year uh, 1926, he flew uh, to the Arctic and back with uh, Floyd Bennett in a plane that was designed by uh, Fokker. Uh, Byrd had Fokker build uh, another plane, uh, Fokker, which is a Fokker trimotor called the America. Um, this 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 expedition was sponsored by Rodham Wanamaker. Does anybody know what the name Wanamaker? Yeah, the Wanamaker is an department store. Rodman Wanamaker was the son of the founder of the Wanamaker's department store, and he put up $100,000 to support uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, attempt at the Ortiz Prize. On April 16, 1927, in, in Teterboro, New Jersey, uh, they did a test flight of the America. Falker was at the, at, uh, as the pilot. Bird was not a pilot, so, but, but he did... Uh, he did attend, or he did fly with, with Walker. Floyd Bennett would be the pilot in the, in the transatlantic attempt, and George Novo, no, Noville was the engineer. And the, the test flight actually went quite well. The plane flew as it was intended. The difficulty came when they tried to land it, because as they were approaching, Walker was turning down the, the throttle, and the tail of the plane started rising. This is before he landed. And immediately, Walker knew that something was was wrong, the plane was nose heavy, he uh, re-engaged uh, re, re the throttle, went back for another pass, and he realized that he had to come in with full throttle. So he came in with full throttle and cut the engines just as he landed. Still had the same problem, but now he had cut the, cut the throttle, cut the engines, and the tail uh, rose and the plane landed upside down. Fokker walked away uninjured. Uh, the other three passengers were injured to various uh, degrees. Uh, Bird had a broken arm. Uh, Noville had some internal injuries. Uh, Bennett also had some internal injuries. 
So that attempt was uh, was uh, unsuccessful, and uh, but we'll return to to Bird a little bit later in the story. There was a, a, a team that was really uh, a surprise to most of the people that were actually going towards uh, the, the Ortiz Prize. This was a team consisting of Noel Davis and Stanton Worcester. Both of them were Navy pilots. They received $100,000 support from the American Legion to build a plane for the, for the transatlantic flight. Uh, they went to a company in Bristol, Pennsylvania called Keystone Aircraft and they built the Keystone Pathfinder. Another tri-motor plane. Uh, they were very methodical in how they were going to test this plane. So they would fly it partially loaded and then increase the weight, test fly it again. Uh, having seen the incidents of the other pilots who tried to cross, uh, they were going to be uh, very systematic in how they approached it. In uh, about 24 days before Lindbergh took off, they did a test flight from Virginia. They went down the runway, everything was going fine. The issue was the plane was just too heavy when it was fully loaded and uh, they barely got it off the ground by the end of the runway. And there was a stand of trees a little bit past the runway. In order to uh, prevent hitting the trees, they made a hard pitch to the left, and the plane stalled. It then crashed into a marsh. Sadly, the plane went in nose first. Both pilots died. Suffocation. Of suffocation. Uh, I think they were both. I think probably the wings were wooden. Uh, maybe the, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that the, the fuselage at least had some metal parts in it. So we had uh, two fatalities, right? And of course, we know the story of Nunjaser Nun and Francois Collie, right? Nunjaser is a World War I uh, ace with 43 victories. Francois Collet uh, joined in the infantry, uh, got injured, and then moved over to uh, the, the French Air Service. They were flying in this plane called the Louise Blanc, or White Bird. This was 12 days before Lindbergh was leaving. And we, we all know that uh, their plane was never found. Uh, to this day, we don't know where it is. So I thought, hey, it'd be interesting to see what people had said about where the... Where the uh, the white bird may have gone down. So in my research, there were several sightings. Several sightings of the white bird, one here and just on the French coast, uh, the Isle of Wight, Exeter, England, and Kilkey in Ireland. So people actually claim to have seen the bird over, uh, overfly those regions. There was a fisherman in France who reported seeing plane wreckage just off the coast of Ertrat but uh, the French Navy was never able to find it. The next sighting was off of Newfoundland. People had uh, heard uh, a plane overhead around the same date that, as they were flying in Harbor Grace, Newfoundland. People in St. Mary's heard a plane in distress, and several people reported plane wreckage in a place called Gull Pond in Newfoundland. In fact, there were four people who claimed to have pieces of train wreckage which they recovered from Gull Pond. The interesting thing was when they were asked to, to show it, the first person said, well, it was stolen. The second person said, uh, it was accidentally thrown out when I moved from one house to another. And the last two pieces happened to disappear in a house fire. So there was never actually any pieces of wreckage that could ever be identified to uh, Nunjaser and Coley's plane. There was also a fisherman in St. Pierre, Newfoundland, who claimed to have heard something crash in the ocean, but searches there never found anything. And then there were claims in Maine. Uh, people in Cooper, Maine, claimed to have heard a plane, and a fisherman claimed to have heard a crash. But again, they never found any wreckage. In 1958, in 1958, several hunters claimed to have seen a, a crash in the woods near Round Lake in Maine, uh, but they didn't report it. They said, well, there's, a, there's some logging going on over there. I'm sure those logging guys reported it. And then, of course, once they reported, went to see whether there was any evidence, there was no evidence found. So to this day, there's no evidence as to where 
uh, Francois Coley and uh, Charles Nungesser went down. Sadly, they were the next two losses in this attempt. The one that's most interesting to me is this guy, Charles Levine. Levine was born in 1897. He uh, made a lot of money after World War I selling uh, surplus equipment from the government. So much so that in January of 1927, he teamed up with uh, Giuseppe Balanca, uh, who's an airplane designer and was working at, at the Wright Company at the time, and they formed a new company called Columbia Aircraft. And Le Levine purchased this plane, the Columbia, right? And I think you know the story. Lindbergh tried to buy this plane. He showed up with a check in hand in New York City, and Levine said, okay, I'll sell you this plane. You know, they had negotiated the price beforehand. He said, yeah, I'll sell you this plane at the agreed upon price, but I want to be able to tell you, I want to be able to pick the pilot. And of course, Lindbergh was furious. That, that was not part of the original agreement, right? Levine added this later on to, to have a little bit more control. So Lindbergh leaves and eventually finds Levine always had in mind what the next way to make money is. He had the, the, the plane Columbia. He was going to try for the transatlantic prize for the transatlantic prize. He wanted to have a very photogenic pilot. So skills were less important to him than to have a photogenic pilot because his idea was once they do cross the Atlantic, that I will be able to sell the movie rights to Hollywood. Right? So he was looking around for a photogenic pilot, he found one, he was going to hire that pilot, but Balanca insisted that Levine use Clarence Chamberlain, because Balanca and Chamberlain had worked together at Wright Aircraft, and Chamberlain was a test pilot. So he knew uh, uh, Chamberlain's skill set, and uh, Levine also included this guy, Bert Acosta, who actually taught uh, Levine how to fly. Right? And Acosta was known in, in, in the racing, racing circuit. Levine uh, was not sure which of these two pilots uh, he would choose, but he knew one co-pilot he wanted was this guy, Lord Bertot. He was also known in, in the racing circuit. Um, he had his own agenda. He was selling book rights in the event that he uh, were to cross the Atlantic. And Levine got pretty, pretty upset about that because he wanted to control all the rights. Um, and he almost threw uh, Berthold off the, off the team. In order to demonstrate the capabilities of the Columbia, Chamberlain and Acosta made a demonstration flight around New York, an endurance flight, 51 hours, 11 minutes, 25 seconds. So demonstrating the capability of this plane to stay in the air that long to make the transatlantic flight. To generate publicity, Levine says, you know what, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pick the pilot by lottery on the day of the flight. And this was too much for Acosta. He said, I've had enough, I'm going to resign, Chamberlain and, and Berto, you can, you can do the flight. Well, Levine had negotiated with Chamberlain and Berto for a contract as to how much they were going to get for successfully completing the flight. And one of the things he negotiated was that if the plane went down, that Levine would have a life insurance policy for both of them to support their families. So Levine shows up at the contract, and the terms of the agreement were not in the contract. In fact, there was no life insurance policy written into the contract. And Berthaud got very upset, and so he took the disagreement to court. <laughs> the plane was impounded. It was put in a hangar on the runway. And the injunction was not lifted until the afternoon of May 20th, 1927, just hours after Lindbergh left Roosevelt Field. <laughs> and we all know the story of Lindbergh's record-setting flight. I'm not going to spend time here. I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, but Levine still wanted to have uh, uh, a place in the history books. So he convinced uh, Chamberlain that they should make a longer flight than what uh, Lindbergh did. So you know, on June 4th, 16 days after Lindbergh, they made a nonstop flight from New York, and they almost made it to Berlin. They ran out of gas on the way. The interesting story here is Levine was, uh, Levine's wife was very angry at him, did not want him to do any flying on, on this type of trip. 
So just before the flight, he walks over to Tom, uh, Chamberlain, who's by the plane, and they have a conversation. And all of a sudden, Levine jumps in the plane, and Chamberlain takes off. And his wife, Levine's wife, is standing there thinking, I told him not to go, and he went anyway. But they, Levine was the first, considered to be the first transatlantic passenger. Bird made another attempt shortly after that, and he actually made it to Paris, but Paris was so fogged in, he spent hours flying around the city, not unable to land. He eventually uh, took the, the plane to the coast and ditched the plane on the coast. After the Ortique Prize, uh, Fonck was uh, made position of inspector of all the French fighters in 1937, from 1937 to 1939. Um, because of his uh, connections with uh, Herman Gehry, the Vichy government wanted him to arrange a meeting between Marshal Patton and, and Herman Gehry, uh, which he did. He was later accused of collaborating with the Vichy regime, but then cleared after an investigation after World War II. December of 1929, he was promoted to uh, Rear Admiral, the youngest admiral in naval history. And in 1934, he spends five months in the Antarctic over the winter, and he nearly dies of carbon monoxide poisoning because of uh, the exhaust from his, his stove. It's a very interesting book called Alone. I highly recommend it if you're interested. And our friend Charles Levine. Well, after the flights, uh, he lost all his money in the stock market crash of 1929. In 1930, the government took him to court because he owed $500,000 in back taxes. He ended up paying only $500, and the government uh, basically wrote, wrote off the rest of the money. He was arrested for trying to buy dye to stamp out two French, uh, franc, uh, two franc coins uh, to counterfeit French, French currency. He divorced his first wife in 1935 and remarried the next day. Uh, he's charged with smuggling a ton of tungsten powder from Canada and serves two years in federal prison at which point his second wife divorced him. And uh, in 1942, he was convicted of trying to smuggle a German alien into the United States across the Mexican border. <laughs> then, then, then Levine's uh, trail goes cold. He lives uh, to, in, into his 90s. He died in 1991. So the Ortiz Prize took six people's lives. Um, three people were injured. Four planes were lost, three of them were triplanes, tri tri planes. And so, you know, it occurred to me that, you know, we had to say hail to the forgotten flyers. These are people who don't just witness history, they actually shape it. Right? And although sometimes they're caught up in the frenzy of competition, uh, they see past what is a, was possible to what is what was considered impossible. So that's why I put this uh, talk together. I think they deserve to be remembered. And I'll leave you with this quote from Theodore Roosevelt. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the great twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Bert. Yes. Richard Byrd had leased Roosevelt Field for exclusive use. That's right. And he allowed Lindbergh to take off under his lease. That's exactly right. So, uh, did everybody hear that? So, Byrd Bird had rented the, the field, right? Roosevelt George? Field. Roosevelt. Byrd had rented Roosevelt Field, and in a, a case of excellent sportsmanship, right, he allowed Lindbergh to use the field to take off in, on May 20th. Yes, I. Go ahead. Oh, uh, back to the Montgolfier brothers. I, I, I'm not. I didn't stay up with the covering. Was it silk right from the beginning? It was. Uh, it was silk covered in paper. So the the uh, colored uh, uh, images on the outside of the balloon were paper covering. Because I've been lying to some of the visitors. I told them that <laughs> there was a guy standing in the in the basket with a bucket of water and a long bamboo pole with a rag on the end, if you heard that story? No, I haven't. Putting out the, the fire. Oh, it, it, could be, it could be that they're because they were trying to, they needed to keep the air hot, right? 
and they didn't have a very good method to, to do that. But and so it's quite possible. It was yeah. silk right from the beginning. Well, it's silk on the inside, paper on the outside, so it could be that he was trying to keep the paper from and it. And then they figured out how to cover it with the rubber and turpentine. They used that, well, I, I think they probably did use that for hot air balloons as well, uh, but they, it originally was um, uh, for hydrogen balloons. But very available, it's strong. Just a purpose to put right, so George is saying they used a, a, a bale of wet straw to, to prevent the, the, the uh, balloon from igniting. But what did the turpentine do? So the turpentine... It evaporated? Was, yeah, the turpentine evaporated, okay. yes. So then that sealed... That, yes, that, okay. exactly. That sealed. So the rubber stayed, the stay, turpentine yeah. evaporated, Got it. Got it. forming a, 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 an impermeable seal. Right. Okay, sorry I went a little long. Well done. Thank you.